So good morning, everyone. Welcome to IMC. Some uh, weeks ago, uh, I made, or, or some mention was made about the Buddhist teachings on not self, and I think there was an interest in hearing more about this, and I said I would at some point, and um, so now is the time. And um, <clears throat> it's, uh, I like this topic quite a bit uh, in that <clears throat> uh, I associate it as a teaching that uh, addresses some of the fundamental suffering of human beings. And when we're meeting people or encountering ourselves in our suffering, it's a tender thing. Uh, human beings, our connection we have with each other, the connection we have with ourselves, is very important and, um, and a tender, hopefully caring thing um, that uh, we have some love for, concern for. And that this teaching of not-self is uh, to understand it uh, or to realize it, more importantly, uh, is a way of caring for ourselves and for others. And so that's a little bit the spirit I want to, through which I want to, or the attitude I want to kind of present this, if I can. Because uh, it's very easy for this teaching of not-self to get pretty heady. Uh, and it's often presented as a philosophy or as some kind of doctrine that this is how things are. And, um, and it's not meant to be a philosophy at all, I don't think but rather it's supposed to be a realization, something that we realize or see for ourselves experientially. Uh, and so if you don't understand the Buddhist teachings on not-self, um, y- uh, you don't have to try too hard. You know, it's, it's not exactly something that's meant to be understood as a doctrine and kind of logically put, put it all together and. Um, and you might find lots of logical reasons why this doesn't make sense. And, um, but uh, uh, don't, don't get too hung up about that. Um, the, um, and I think that um, one way of preparing for this teachings of not-self is to uh, first talk about the Buddha's perspective or understanding of what it is to be a person. And uh, if you go through his teachings that, that survive, um, he doesn't you know, specifically say, you know, this is my understanding of personhood, what it means to be a person. But uh, the way that he, Buddha talks about human beings, about people, Um, you can kind of piece together that there is a kind of general view, understanding, of what it means to be a a person. And uh, the teachings of not-self are not meant to be a a, um, negation of the basic understanding of what it means to be a person. That uh, the whole kind of enterprise of Buddhism, at 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 least in terms of early Buddhism, is based on. And, um, and I find uh, in my reading of these early teachings that there's a lot of respect and valuing of the individual, the individual person, both in the uh, individual uniqueness of the person and that which is universal about a human being, about, a, in, about people. And, um, and the word personhood kind of, I, in my mind, kind of bridges both that which is unique and specific to individuals and that which is universal. If you talk about human beings, maybe it's more universal for human beings, what we're talking about. Um, and, uh, and to understand who we are as human beings, as beings, as persons, is one of the great enterprises of human life. And uh, many people in other religions besides Buddhism are involved in the enterprise of understanding who am I and what am I and what's going on here. And sometimes, uh, and I've probably been responsible for this when I was young and idealistic Buddhist teacher, uh, that uh, people who, you know, ask, you know, who am I or what am I, uh, I would reply maybe with some kind of 
kind of trying to you know, pull the rug from underneath them and say, well, there is no self. <laughs> so, you know, so, you know, get over it <laughs> or something. <laughs> so now that I'm, you know, old and maybe a teeny bit wiser, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, it's, um, I'm, I feel more tender around this topic. The... Um, because we're, you know, as I said earlier, we're really, you know, touching in for many people, the idea of discovering who they are, connecting to who they are, waking up to what's here, is through uh, the layers of our suffering and our challenges. And so it's a tender thing to kind of connect and be pure. And so uh, there's a story that from the Ramayana that uh, is often quoted in the Vipassana world that I'm fond of as well. And that is that uh, Rama is walking in the woods with companions and he hears a very faint voice. He can't quite make out what's, what it's saying. And he asks his companions, uh, do you hear this, you know, the voice? You hear something? And no one else hears it. So he begins to walk towards that voice and no one still hears it, but he gets closer and then he hears it, what it's saying. And what it's saying is his name, Rama. Rama. So he goes closer and finds it, and it seems to be coming out of a, l- a large boulder. You know, boulders are solid, maybe granite. I don't know if they're granite in India, but I think of it as granite. And, um, and so uh, he takes the soft palms of his hands and he, with his hands and he touches the boulder. And as I kind of remember the story, then the boulder breaks open and inside there is a woman. And I don't know why she's there, but <laughs> but she's been there for a very long time, and uh, and that fr- frees her, and uh, and so as a as you know to interpret this as a myth, which you know often the characters of myth are all ourselves, then um, you know what is it that's petrified inside of ourselves, what's frozen inside of ourselves, and what's calling for us, calling our name. In what way are we calling for ourselves to connect and be present for ourselves? And we don't take a sledgehammer to that, but we take uh, what's soft and tender and and we just touch it and meet it and uh, once we find it. And uh, and then something gets revealed, something opens up. And what is that? And uh, different, certainly religions have different answers of what's core essential inside. And so to begin getting to what maybe the Buddha had to say, I'll kind of say a few things about personhood, how the, how the Buddha understands what it is to be a person. Um, and um, so one of the things that a person is, uh, the nature of being a human being, is that um, a person is uh, subject to suffering and to happiness. Uh, subject to aging, dying, subject to integration, becoming kind of whole, and disintegration, becoming fragmented, becoming connected to themselves and being alienated from what's here. A person, a person is subject to um, healing and to wounding or illness, psychological illness. And in classic Buddhist language, A person uh, is subject to bondage and to freedom. We can be caught in our attachments or we can break free of those, untie those attachments and become free. And so we're subject to this. This is the nature of us, this. Now, um, uh, another one is that uh, very important for being a person. Is it clear the Buddha saw that each person as an individual is a moral agent? that we're responsible for the ethical choices we make, uh, the choices we make to cause harm or cause benefit, that uh, that's something that we're responsible for. And we don't, we're not just kind of like robots that go through life and you know, we're on some kind of automatic, you know, what do they call for cars these days? It's self-driving cars, we're like <laughs> self-drive, self-driven ethics, you know. <laughs> That uh, it involves reflection and care and attention and uh, and cultivation of a, m- a moral character that uh, we have responsibility for, and so we're moral agents. 
And uh, in that regard, human beings are subject to being able to make choices, choices of what they do. And so the Buddha does distinguish, and if we, uh, to use a provocative English word, um, if you just, if you allow me to, the Buddha discriminates between people, uh, distinguishes between people, and not on anything inherent, but rather based on their choices they do. And so it's kind of like people self-identify themselves by their choices. And so if someone is a thief, the Buddha sees them, you know, if someone steals, the Buddha sees that person's a thief. If someone is a, I met a, this morning I met a wonderful park ranger who seems a lovely, beautiful man who, at a local park, who was um, preparing to receive Eagle Scout volunteers. And he just seemed like completely kind and supportive and enthusiastic about setting up and having these Eagle Scouts come and repair a trail. So, you know, he, you know, so he was a, uh, I don't know, so by his choice, he wasn't just a park ranger or something, he was a, a kind person. And so, you know, so we can differ, so the Buddha would differentiate people. So someone who's a, who farms is a farmer. Someone who's, you know, whatever it is. So the Buddha identified people by what their choices and what they did. And a huge part of that for the Buddha was their moral choices, the ethical choices. So he was very clear identifying people by their morality if they did something. And then, but he wasn't like keeping them in a box and saying, this is who you are, but rather uh, pointing to the fact that you have choice and you can grow and you can go in a different direction and become a different person. And so this idea that we become different, we can grow and develop and change, is inherent in the Buddhist teachings of change, of impermanence, of inconstancy. Um, the teachings of not-self are clearly built on the teachings of impermanence. Oh, that's the, it's the experience of impermanence that gives us the experience of not-self. And the radical nature of change, the changing nature of ourselves and the world, is a huge uh, uh, foundation for understanding and not self. And sometimes when we talk too much about impermanence in Buddhism, it can seem like this is, you know, these Buddhists are always kind of talking about impermanence and it's kind of a, kind of a drag. Everything's impermanence can sound pretty depressing for some people. Uh, but the fact that things change and constantly in, a, in flux, both in, implies that things are lost and end, but it also implies that things begin but it also implies that things are changeable. Change doesn't mean that we're the victim of change. That things are, everything's changed means we can, we, can, we can set the direction of that change. And we can change ourselves, change our character, change our moral stance in the world, how we live, our choices, all kinds of things. And so this uh, part of the uh, Buddhist view of the person is that we can, uh, we can, establish, we can commit ourselves to choices we can commit ourselves to ways of living that better ourselves and the better the world around us. And, uh, and so this is clearly a view of the person the Buddha has. So human beings can grow and develop. Um, along those lines, the Buddha saw that a human being is subject to cause and effect, to conditionality. So that uh, whatever we do has consequences. And we can take responsibility for those consequences. We can set in place the conditions that allows us to become better people. We can put conditions in place, allow ourselves to become better servants or uh, carers, carers of the world around us. And so, um, so that, you know, that's nice. The other thing, that the uh, last thing I want to say that uh, about the Buddhist view of personhood is that... Um, spiritual liberation, liberation of the heart, is worthwhile. Uh, it's a worthwhile goal. And that it's a potential we all have. So this idea of potential is very important. We have the nature of certain potential. We certainly have potential to do evil, but we also have a potential to do good. And it's kind of separate from both those categories, uh, but related to the second, the doing good, is we have the potential for liberation. We have the potential to uh, heal ourselves and then open, I like the language of opening the heart, free the heart from um, all that 
all the fetters and ties and chains and contractions and armor that's maybe around it. And this ability to kind of break free, um, there's a powerful language in the ancient world of um, uh, 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 bursting this mass of darkness. Someone who's awakened bursts through the mass of darkness. So we have this potential. And, um, and this is the kind of who we are and kind of our nature. Now, in later Buddhism, they got very reluctant to, um, to, to even, especially in the modern world, to talk about, some Buddhists, to talk about that human beings have a nature because it's very easy to lead to the idea that we have some essential nature. Like this is a true nature, and, and, you know, and the idea of essentiality, uh, people are a little bit sometimes shy around. If the essential nature means something permanent existing and always there. But we don't want to get too hung up about this reification of essential nature. Uh, there can still be nature inside of us that's potential, that's changing. And so like the subject of be, uh, the, the having nature of growing, we all have that, you know. Uh, the rumor is that every single one of you at one point uh, was a child running around in diapers. <laughs> I don't want to, you know, assume too much, but, <laughs> but you know, you, there was probably, probably if all of us gathered here when, you know, and we're here in this room together when, and could see each other, or if maybe you're the only adult and everyone else here showed up and they were like two years old here in the room, I, I think we, our hearts would all break open. I think it'd be so cute. <laughs> and um, so, you know, so we, we've grown and developed and now we're this age and maybe it's a little bit harder to have our hearts breaking open so clearly, but it's pretty sweet that we're here and together, and wonderful. So, um, and this idea that, you know, at the, um, we have nature, and nature uh, is uh, represented kind of nicely in a, a very important chant that uh, we chant sometimes. Sometimes it's done at funerals, sometimes it's done at births. It's, uh, whenever the Buddhists can, maybe, it's a good one. It has to do with a chant on impermanence that in Pali goes something like, Anicca vata sankara upadovai yodamino upakituva niruchanti tesang vupasamo sukho all things are impermanent. All conditioned things are impermanent. They have the nature to arise and pass. They have the possibility of stilling, of quieting, of ceasing. The stilling of all these conditions and these formations, these mental conditions, is the greatest happiness. So here we have this, all things arise and pass, and they have the word, uh, have the nature uh, of being impermanent. Uh, uh, no, no, uh, all things are impermanent, they have the nature of arising and passing. I probably mistranslated it. And, um, the, um, and the word for nature is dhamma, dharma, which has many different meanings, the word dharma. But here it's being used, uh, meaning nature or a subject to, subject to arising and passing, nature of arising and passing. This very, very central word that's associated with what the Buddha's teaching is itself. So the fact that it comes together. So to really experience, that's, so it points to how things do have a nature, but it's not an essential nature. It's not like a permanent thing, like core, but it has this nature of arising and passing, of change. And a huge part of mindfulness practice and Buddhist practice is to attune ourselves to the impermanent, changing nature of reality, of ourselves, what's going on. And I chose the word attune ourselves carefully to a little bit give you a different sense rather than to understand or to realize. But uh, you know, I could almost use the word to be in harmony with but attune ourselves or resonate with or center ourselves in the middle of this changing world. And as we were meditating here just before this talk, um, I could see myself 
sometimes being attuned to the present moment in a deep, clear way, and feeling how things were shifting and changing, and kind of like, you know, um, you know, like resting on the waves of the ocean and feeling myself moved around by them nicely, massaged by it. Uh, and then uh, I could find myself drifting off in thought. And I could see how in the thinking, uh, I would get uh, things which feel a little bit more solid. A little bit like the thinking, the concepts and ideas uh, took me out of the world, the experiential world of change, into the world of something that has more constancy because concepts give us a cons- constancy. Even if I'm thinking about what's changing, the way I think about it, I'm kind of like latching on, holding on. And so they're going to come back to the uh, to resting in this flow, the changing nature of phenomena. And uh, it'd be a little bit like if you were watching maybe a river go by and you're kind of mesmerized or absorbed and watching the waves and the current and everything. And it's very peaceful and nice. And, um, and then uh, you remembered something that, you know, you know that, uh, important thing you had to do and, and suddenly you're thinking about that or some resentment you have, you're thinking about that and you lose touch with the river and the change and now you're kind of in your caught, contracted around something. This movement away from being contracted in our thoughts back into the river of our life, the river of, you know, the currents of what's going on in here is a huge part of the direction we're going at Vipassana meditation. As we do this, and we're no longer caught in our thoughts, and we're here in the flow of the experience, that's when these teachings of not-self become more interesting and more relevant to see it, how it works. Because one of the things you can see is that, uh, is that it's one thing to rest and be present in the flow of the river of life, the experience in the moment. And then you can see how self-preoccupation takes you out of it. How uh, being concerned with self, me, myself, and mine, and that uh, it, you know, it does involve this leaving that world into the world of contraction, of concepts, ideas, and then, and then we lose touch in something. Now, some of the th- times we think about ourselves could be wonderful. We can have wonderful fantasies about how great things are. And, um, and, uh, and sometimes if it's about the future, um, you know, it's, the future has a lot of hope for some people. And, uh, and so it can be quite kind of compelling you know, to be up there until the future comes and nothing like what we hoped it would be. And that, what was I thinking, you know? And then, um, or we get caught up in the past and, uh, and whatever the past was. So sometimes, it, sometimes it's problematic to get caught up in those thoughts. Sometimes it's very seductive. Sometimes it can be very pleasant. But it is a separation away from here. And if what we're doing is putting our hands on the boulder to really feel what's here and let it kind of break open or kind of dissolve or something. It's, you know, it really requires us to be really, really be here in the experience. And so, as I said, as, we, as we're able to do that better and better, we notice how we leave that experience. And if you're paying attention to how much selfing is going on, how much me, myself, and my concerns are going on, probably is a high percentage of them. And then to be able to not get caught up in that self-preoccupation all the time is one of the great tasks of life. To really kind of discover what we're like without it. Uh, I was walking up in the hills a week ago or so here and um, and at the local park, Edgewood Park, there's a lot of deer and they are... Um, I, they must be very used to people. <laughs> because um, uh, I walked by and the deer was about 10 feet away. And uh, she looked up at me. But the deer have big eyes. If you're close up, boy, those deer eyes are quite something. <laughs> and um, and uh, she looked up at me completely unconcerned that I was 10 feet away. And, and I, I, kind of, I think she saw me. And uh, I think unconcerned because she looked at me for a while and then she went back to eating. And, um, and, um, but in those moments, 
that we made eye contact, as I thought we did. I was, you know, at least I was looking at her eyes and being, felt like being seen. Um, I was not thinking, boy, I'm a good deer seer. <laughs> I, really, I really know how to stare at a deer, to really be a deer, and I better tell people how great I am at looking at deer, and boy, I'm really hot stuff here. The opposite happened. And this is what, what, why I'm telling the story. That, you know, for those moments, uh, the you know self-concern was not in the picture at all. That kind of selfing thing. Everything went. Something inside went very still and quiet. And um, and so this ability to have a mind, we have the potential to have a mind that alive and present and experience life, that's not constantly being self-referential self-consciously referential, self-referential that's preoccupied with itself and trying to prove itself or apologize for itself or something, prove it. So, so um, and it can be a relief. So what we start seeing is how much we do this and how much it's not necessary. It might be necessary in some times. After all, we're moral agents. No one else is going to think for us about what to do. We're responsible for ourselves. So some kind of thinking about ourselves is quite appropriate. But to always do it is, uh, is a form of attachment. And so to learn to put it to rest when it's not needed and to let go is certainly nice. It's rest, restful and nice. But it's also a doorway to understand more and more deeply how to live a life, how to be present, how to experience real freedom from self and self-concern. And, um, and as meditation practice unfolds, and we're able to let go of self-concern and these thoughts, ideas of me, myself, and mine, and just be alive and present with a kind of stillness in the mind around self as I was looking in the, into the eyes of the deer perhaps. You probably have a similar reference for yourself. Uh, and probably the, if you want to find your own reference for this, maybe think of a time in your life when maybe you, you felt safe enough, uh, uh, things were comfortable or pleasant enough, uh, that you were involved in something, or maybe because you weren't involved in anything, except maybe looking at something like a river, that you also had the experience of self-concern just dropped away. And maybe for some moments, there was, that was part of the relief and the beauty of it, was you weren't thinking about yourself in any kind of way, and your projects and your needs and your resentments and you know, all the different things. But just, just, just to be alive is enough. Just to be here and settled and quiet. And so to, uh, to, fall, to kind of settle in or drop in to that, that kind of way of being is our potential. And it's a remarkable thing to discover that we have the potential to have a state of heart and mind that's not preoccupied by things, that's really uh, rooted or centered here in the present moment without the mind having any tendency to drift off and think about things or be preoccupied with things. It's not an easy place to experience a meditation, but we have that potential. And it's a wonderful kind of north star to both to head towards but also to use as a reference point to understand better how we do get preoccupied, which is part of, a huge part of the task, is to really see that well. As these things settle down, the, there are uh, periods of uh, in, very significant insights that uh, the tradition holds up as being very important in this path to liberation. The first insight that's important is what's called um, uh, uh, um, um, understanding is giving up uh, any belief in the, uh, any belief in what's called sakaya ditti. Sakaya ditti means view or philosophy or doctrine, and sakaya is a difficult word to translate. It literally means the true body or the existing body. So any belief in the existing body or the true body. Some uh, uh, Western translators will translate it as individuality, 
uh, some people translate it personality, personality view, they call it, or individual, individualism somehow. And I don't think that really captures what the original is. Uh, in the ancient context, uh, Sakaya Ditti, the Sakaya, true existing body, probably referred to the idea that there is a soul or a spirit or an essential thing that resides inside of us that somehow always been here that in the time of the Buddha people called the in the Atta or the Atman and uh, and the Atman or the Atta is uh, in this context probably meant something like the, sp- the in some in best you know related to the English idea of, of soul and so to realize that there is no essential, permanent, abiding soul or essence or this Atman is a core Buddhist principle. But it isn't so much that it's a principle, it's a realization. And it's not really exactly a negation of this soul theory either, because that's just more philosophy to negate something. But rather, it to be settled enough, quiet enough, clear enough, in the present moment, seeing what's here, in the experience of things, moment by moment, free of all these concepts we have, but just the experiential data of our senses and perceptions, and become really clear that here, there is nothing that qualifies as being permanent. Nothing that qualifies as being an essential, ongoing, permanent thing that we can call a self. If there is one or isn't one, that's a little bit beside. I mean, if there isn't, if there is one, it's a little bit besides the point. At least from the Buddhist point of view that if it can't be experienced, it's not really relevant for his project. If it can't be seen or known, if it's just a theory, or just something people have, you know, idea people have inherited from their past, it's not really relevant because what people get attached to and cling to and how they get kind of contracted and, and, you know, in bondage is around concepts and ideas and what can be experienced. And so if we're letting go of our attachment to concepts, we have to also let go of the concept of both that the self exists and the, and the concept that the self does not exist. <laughs> and, um, and then if we're uh, focusing on what can be directly experienced, and we still look around, see nothing here can be Nothing here, everything so it's changing, none of this is actually permanent. Nothing is the existing body or the existing self. And that realization supports people to begin letting go of attachments even more. And begins, gives people a, a very palpable and visceral experience of release that for some people is life changing rather than always chasing after the next thing, the next thing to hold or to be or get, that a lot of this freedom has to do with release. Ah, so nice. And then release around this whole kind of very complicated, complex uh, uh, attachments people have to self, which, you know, um, I think it could come almost like built into being a human being because it's, you know, we are individuals, we are moral agents, so there is a appropriate to focus on ourselves and help ourselves find our way in life and be safe and successful. So it's appropriate that focus. And then we have a lot of societal kind of messages that piles and piles on complicated attachments around what it means to be a self. Uh, all you have to do is spend a little bit of time on advertisements. And there's a lot of messages about what kind of self you should be. Just, just there, and people, very smart people, get paid a lot of money to convince convince you <laughs> that you're supposed to be a certain kind of person. And so, you know, it may, some of you probably, you know, 
bit the bait. And, um, and but you know, then it's just, you know, politicians and if cultures and you know, all this stuff gets piled and piled on top, this ideas of self. And so it gets very complicated and difficult to kind of begin to shed it. But that's the task of medit- Buddhist meditation, is to begin shedding a lot of this and experiencing this deeper potential we have. A potential which is not an essential thing in terms of a thing, but it has to do with the essential impermanence, the essential changeableness, the essential possibility of growth, the essential possibility of being a moral agent, the essential nature of becoming free. And um, so this is what the the teachings of, uh, this is all kind of pointing to the teachings of not-self. And so finally I'll say that uh, to translate anatta as not self rather than no self is actually quite important. When you say there's no self, then you're making a philosophical claim, metaphysical claim. If you're saying not self, it's more like an adjective. It's just kind of describing something as being not self. It's called a characteristic of things, that the things we actually can experience moment by moment that things that appear and go, they have the characteristic the, uh, of being uh, changeable. Things That's obvious, right? If things are changing, they have the characteristic of being changing, right? Those things that are constantly changing also have the characteristic of they themselves are not self. Does that mean there's no self? The Buddha explicitly said, don't bother with that. <laughs> and as in one place he calls it a quagmire and I think of it as a philosophical quagmire once you go down this road of saying there's no self which many Buddhists do uh, you're, you're caught <laughs> you're caught in doctrine and philosophy and, and, um, but there are experiences of not self and there's beautiful experiences where it feels like here there is no self in this experience so there are those experiences. But I think what, we, what the Buddha is saying is, enjoy them. Learn how they teach you not to cling. But don't come to any philosophical conclusion that there is or is not a self. Be a responsible person and become free. So that's my attempt today. To, to introduce this idea of not-self. So we have about five minutes. If uh, you want some clarification or questions about that or, or have counter views. Um, I hope I can find the right way to express this question. Um, in regards to experiencing and and knowing that it's not self it's not soul and all this how um what did the buddha let's see how do i want to ask this um what what do i think of who is it that's doing this experiencing you know who yeah. is it? Yeah, yeah, that's I mean, it. I, I, I'm. I, I don't know how to answer that question for myself. Yeah, it, it might not be necessary to answer the question. If you, uh, to the degree to which uh, you're the moral agent or the agent of choice, uh, uh, you can you can just say, you know, I'm experiencing this, and not, and not not need you don't need to know exactly who I am in terms of the essential nature. Um, but uh, but you know it's in a conventional way you know I'm talking and you're you're hearing me I think that's enough for me <laughs> but um, but uh, when we get quiet uh, then there can be hearing without there being a hearer there's seeing but no seer there's tasting but no taster. And when we realize the idea of a seer, a hearer, a taster is, a, is an idea, a concept that's laid on top of it. It's like, a, it's like the wrapping. It's like a general concept. It's helpful, 
because um, you know if if I'm hungry, uh, you know it's helpful to be clear I'm the one who's hung- hungry, so I can go do something about it. But if um, but if I'm really quiet, I realize there's experience of hunger, but I don't have to say I'm hungry. There's experience of pain. I don't have to say I'm in pain. And actually to experience hunger without the eye, pain without the eye, it becomes a lot simpler. And so you might, you know, you, you, know, you live in a nice place where there's ducks and water and you might go out and see what it's like just to um, experience those things as you walk down the pathway there and um, without any concern about who's, exper- who's seeing the ducks. It's just seeing. It, yeah, I, I guess I'm thinking in terms of um, how do I handle this at the time of death? If I am aware of that I am dying, well, is it I am dying, or you know how how do I how do I encompass that? Uh-huh. Um, what what's the need to encompass it? Well, I don't know. I mean, it just <laughs> uh, you know I'm not dying yet, but <laughs> I don't think. But it just seems important. I mean, when when I am considering death, when I'm thinking about death and the big change, that's the biggest change that I'm going to experience now, um, I, I would like to have um, some sense of who is this happening to or how. Now, I'm not, I'm not, answer, I'm not questioning, I'm not asking this yeah. right. But do you get what I'm trying to say? So let me, let me say, say that my attitude towards my dying uh, is directly related to some of the clearest experiences I've had in meditation, where self-concern was not present at all. That uh, if I'm lucky, about fortunate about how I die, I die well, you know, without being comatose or in too much pain, but I have enough clarity, I kind of look forward to dying. Because uh, I imagine that it's uh, very much the same pr- process that goes on with meditation deepens and deepens. And that I trust that process. And so I trust the letting go process. And I trust the letting go of self-concern. And the question of who's dying, to, I, I imagine if I'm dying, that's completely the last thing on my mind. That's irrelevant. Um, and I knew one person who, um, uh, who was dying and he got all these books on death and dying, so um, he would do it right. <laughs> you know, I don't know. The, the, you know, people have been dying for a long time, so you know, it, you don't have to. You know, it, the system knows how to take care of it. And I, and I, tr- I trust that. I trust the system. If I let go, if I relax, I stay present. It, what I don't trust is fear. What I don't trust is anguish or clinging to something. And uh, that makes it hard. And, uh, and then I think if I was clinging or really afraid while I'm dying, then I might you know, have some more, more concerns or look at, Gil, who do you think you are? <laughs> what's, this, what's that self that's clinging and holding on? I'd bring the mindfulness to that. Because I spent you know, so many years looking at the clinging, the contraction around self, that if that happened when I was dying, I would just, turn my attention to that. But if it's not there, I just let go. Let go. And trust the process. May I ask just one more thing? How, how does then one hold grief at, at the death of someone else? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. How do we hold grief at the death of someone else? Um, uh, uh, I think with a lot of kindness and clarity and space and uh, non-embarrassment and a willingness to have it move through us. And so for me, I would sit in, I I like very much the image of, I would find my grief, which I do sometimes when I have it, and, uh, and try to sit right in the middle of it as if it can be there forever, as if it has its own life, 
and then and, and allow it to be there with the attitude, something wants to be born here. What is it that wants to be born in this grief? And so I'm kind of, and for me, saying this question, what wants to be born here, um, is an antidote to the ever so subtle ways, kind of views or thoughts, a way of thinking, kind of almost invisible that I have, uh, that somehow uh, feels, oh, this is a problem, this is wrong, it shouldn't be here, which actually makes it so much more difficult. And so the question, what wants to be born here, I feel like that gives space for the grief and allows it to be there, permission to be there, and almost like, like you're welcome, come, show yourself. And, uh, and sometimes, uh, in order to die, I'm a little bit reluctant to use the word well, but for now, shorthand, to die well, sometimes we have to resolve some of the stuff, like the grief we have. And so doing this practice of mindfulness and learning how to open to this and be present for it in an uncomplicated way is really powerful. So um, may, you, may you take your not-self person <laughs> and uh...